I'm author and critic David Agronoff. I'm a horror and science fiction author, critic, and researcher. In this podcast, I wanted to provide in-depth interviews and panel discussions with everyone from New York Times bestselling authors to researchers, musicians, and anyone I find interesting. Welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Hello and welcome to episode 127 of Postcards from a Dying World. I am your host, David Agronoff, author of The Last Night to Kill Nazis and Punk Rock Ghost Story. And this is the first of an ongoing series that's probably going to last over a year because I'm going to do most of these episodes once a month-ish. Every once in a while, we'll do more than one in a month, so I don't know how long exactly it's going to take me, but we are covering the stories from the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm holding up the book, Um, but for those of you who are just listening to audio, this is Avon Books 1970s, 1970 anthology, right? It came out in 1970, Steve? 68, I think. Oh, Okay. And this covers the years 1934. It says, it says 70, but I believe that it was put together starting in 68. So Right. And and so this is these are the stories. And we're going to talk about the whole process of this because it's the first episode. And this is the only one that's going to talk about it. So I put together a powerhouse panel, as I like to say, <laughs> uh, to discuss this. Um, and um, so I'm going to introduce my guests here and then we'll get into this book and this project and how it came to be and then we're going to talk about stanley g weinbaum's amar's martian odyssey uh which uh was the first story in the collection and one of the seminal stories of science fiction and we'll get into stanley weinbaum the man and the story but my guest today starting uh, uh representing the state of florida in the united states It is Steve Davidson, who is the publisher of Amazing Stories today, Um, the current copyright holder, which is very important. And if you want to hear the story of how Steve ended up being um, the owner and publisher of Amazing Stories, the longest running science fiction magazine under that name, you can listen to episode 102 of this here podcast when I talked to Steve about that and 1920s science fiction we talked about uh in that episode and so that's episode 102 steve welcome to the show thank you and um returning um to postcards from a dying world is cora bullard who is the reigning hugo award winning um uh best fan writer winner i'm not actually the reigning one oh yes i'm I'm barkley one (laughs) who's a very very worthy successor (laughs) yeah so, but Hugo Award winner, which the last time you were on, you were you were just a a, a three time um, finalist, and uh, Cora was on episode eighty eight of this here podcast, covering similarly the first episode of our nineteen thirties science fiction podcast miniseries that I did, and we covered Chamblo by Catherine Lucille Moore with Greg Cox. Highly recommend that episode. And then Cora and I podcasted before on the Dickheads podcast, um, episode 16 of the Dick Jason series. We covered The Big Jump by Lee Brackett, which is one of my favorite um, 50 science fiction novels. So I recommend you go listen to those discussions. Cora is a glorious nerd. I love to have her back on the show. Um, so Cora, welcome back. Well, thanks for having me back again. Always happy to be here. All right. So, um, Steve, we're not going to talk about your amazing story, uh, stories journey because um, we did that in episode 102. Yeah, and, oh. and uh, but we, what you're going to talk about here, I think, is one of the first things we should do is talk about the founding of SIFWA and the Science Fiction Writers Association, because I think SIFWA, you know, is really the driving force behind this anthology. And so while the Hugo Awards were already being given for quite a while at this point, 
uh, the Hugo Awards are fan driven and they're voted by the fans and the members of Worldcon are able to vote for it. And I think at the time there was a desire to have at a professional award that was voted upon or given specifically by the science fiction writers, the professionals. Thus became the Nebula Awards. So that's the difference between the Hugo and the Nebula Awards. But in the founding of the Science Fiction Writers of Associ uh, uh, CIFWA, Science Fiction Writers Association, uh, one of the projects that came up was the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. And uh, one of my primary sources for researching for this episode was your blog post on Amazing from 2014. So a lot of my notes are strictly taken from that. But so you could tell us a lot of this. Maybe start off. By Maybe not. You. I might have forgotten. That was quite a while ago. <laughs> okay, that's true. Um, but part of the idea in this anthology was to to choose the greatest stories of the golden age of science fiction as voted upon by the members of SIFWA. But um, maybe talk about like Steve. Can you tell me anything about the founding of SIFWA? Um, and why it was so important at that time that they have this professional um, voting base? Well, there were there were several prior attempts, like uh, Ted Sturgeon put together, I believe, what it was called the Science Fiction League, um, and that was an effort to market the short stories from the magazines to uh, radio and television production. Um, and uh, as things progressed, um, particularly probably somewhat engendered by um, Saul Cohen's uh, republishing of a whole mess of stories in a variety of magazines uh, starting in the mid 50s uh, without paying the writers, um, spurred Damon Knight uh, and a bunch of other uh, prominent authors at the time to get together and say, we need a writer's guild to represent uh, the science fiction and fantasy authors. Uh, and uh, Damon uh, spearheaded that effort. Uh, and um, it went along, it was fine, but they were looking for a way to um, pretty much emphasize that they had come into being and that they were an uh, effective operation. Um, one of the uh, promotional vehicles that they came up with for that were the nebulas. I mean, you know, every other writer's guild had awards or some kind of uh, uh, end of the year um, get together. Uh, and so uh, CIFWA followed suit, and uh, when they came up with that, the idea was also um, very much so that a lot of their work was based on what had gone on prior, uh, and not even the Yugos went back to the beginning of the uh, field, um, and so they decided that uh, since they were going to institute the Nebula Awards, they were going to put together this anthology that would represent all of the works that were ineligible for the nebula simply because it had not existed at the time that they were published. Uh, and and uh, being the president at the time, uh, Bob Silverberg took over uh, the responsibility to compile the stories and uh, so the story goes that he went to all the members of CIFWA and uh, requested that they recommend, I believe it was no more than five works. Uh, Actually, and... I think they were allowed to recommend 10. Now, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, Which is a lot. <laughs> as, as we get older, you know, memory fades on certain things. Uh, thank goodness for Google to some degree. Uh, and... Um, he did not get in enough stories recommended by the uh, authors. I think it was uh, 15 of the total were selected from the membership. And uh, having been in the field for quite some time, first as a fan and then uh, as an author and familiar with much of the earlier works, 
uh, Silverberg took it upon himself to fill out the uh, contents, uh, and that's what became the final uh, version of the first science fiction Hall of Fame volume. Now, according to what uh, my notes, Nightfall was the story that got the most votes, but right. um, Wine Bombs and Martian Odyssey got the second most votes, and Flowers for Alderaan got third. Oh, and those were yeah. the ones that, like, everybody, that was kind of the consensus stories that most voters gave. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm wondering, Cora, how you feel about the distinction between the Nebulas and the Hugos, because I like to think of it as, you know, I think of things through a PKD lens because I spent so much time researching him. And he, you know, was very proud of his Hugo that he won for Man in the High Castle. But the nom just even getting a nomination from the Nebula felt like when, when it happened for Flow My Tears, he was, I think that the, the fact that it was other writers that were nominating him, like gave a certain cachet to it. And I'm wondering, um, because I know, uh, Corey, you're very um, knowledgeable about the history of the Hugos. What does the Nebulas mean to, to you as a fan? Like, um, I mean, uh, I, I do cover the Nebulas at my blog. blog. I do the, I cover the Nebulas, the Hugos and, Oddly enough, the Dragon Awards, which was just because they started up in 2016 and were very weird at the time, and now it's kind of a tradition that I cover them. <laughs> yeah. Them. But uh, so, yes, um, for me, it was always um, when I started reading, of course, I saw um, books emblazoned with Hugo winner, Nebula winner. So I very quickly figured out, oh, okay, that means this is something special or something good. People apparently gave this an award. And um, if you actually read the books, um, they were they were usually good, good all the stories. So, so it wasn't until much much later that I actually knew the distinction what the difference was between, except the, because before it was just two awards such as the Golden Globes and the and the Oscars are both film awards. But um, people, but a lot of people don't really know what the difference is, is and um, so basically I like both of them. Um, them it depend they both. Um, there's a lot of overlap because I mean even in the first year there was a lot of the the first Nebula winner for best novel was also the Hugo winner for best novel was Dune, which is about as much of a sure bet as you can have in our genre, genre especially in that in that era yeah. because it's one of those absolutely everybody agrees it's a classic even if they don't even the people who don't care for Dune agree that it's a classic, classic and there's been a lot of overlap since in the nominations and the and also the winners winners the nebulas do tend to occasionally recognize nice stories that uh, uh also novels uh, that the uh, hugo's missed because they were published in smaller venues venues which a lot of uh, which a lot of hugo will voters simply might have missed nowadays it's probably because not a lot of people read the uh, at least not enough people read the print magazines anymore so it's easier for some for a story good story published in Asimov's or um FNSF or analog to get a ne nebula nomination simply because um nebula because cipher uh, members are more likely to have read it but um, I mean there's also a lot of let's say overlap in membership because a lot because um, most pros are also fans a lot of fans are also pros in some form also not every Body, uh, who qualifies is a CIFA member. <laughs> I, right. I actually qualify. I'm not a member, not because I don't want to, but it's simply because um, I haven't gotten around to applying yet. I basically have the paperwork ready. I just didn't get around to it because there's a lot going on in my life right now. Yeah, well, and it's it's kind of a similar situation for um, me with HWA is uh, like, I qualify to be in the Horror Writers Association, but um, I had been waiting for, uh, for a very specific thing in my head, which was a nationally distributed book, which I now have with The Last Night to Kill Nazis. So um, I am officially joining HWA. It's always a good night to kill Nazis, I think. <laughs> I mean, yes, exactly. Um, now, so with the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, um, I'll tell the story of, this is my second copy of it. 
Um, I, I bought it when I was a, a kid um, at a used bookstore in my hometown in Indiana because I was buying lots of science fiction. And at the time, two names that were like kind of surefires for me were Richard Matheson and Isaac Asimov at the time. I was reading everything by them. And um, I remembered that I was buying a lot of Asimov and such. And the, the there's a kind of grumpy bookseller at this used bookstore that I used to go to when I was a kid. And he just recently retired and sold the store, by the way. Um, a caveat emptor is the name of the store in my hometown. A lot of my <laughs> books started there. And he had told me at one point, like he had just gotten a copy of this and he said, you need to read this because you're reading all the science fiction. And he told me to buy it. And I am ashamed to say that I never read it back then and somehow <laughs> lost my copy of it and didn't get this until the last year. I was in Indiana uh, visiting family and I found this at a used bookstore. And when I looked at the table of contents, this whole podcast series was immediately in my head. And so I rebought it for this purpose. And so I am going to be rereading many, some of these stories I've read before, but basically I'm going to read these as I do the series. So that's my story on that. Um, Steve, when did you first read the Science Fiction Hall of Fame? Um, I was uh, 10. Uh, I had uh, just previously uh, uh, raided the bookmobile that came to my elementary school and acquired Wells and Verne and uh, this odd looking thing called Starman Jones by some guy named Heinlein. Uh, and um, after reading the classics, uh, I read Starman Jones and that was pretty much it. Um, for me as far as getting into science fiction. Then I made the happy discovery of these things called anthologies. And at the time, uh, you know, 10 years old, 11 years old, uh, very naive about pretty much everything in the world at that time. Uh, so in the concept of an anthology was new to me. And I realized that for the price that I had been spending for a single author's work, I could acquire uh, exposure to a whole mess of authors. And the first one that I, that I picked up was uh, Campbell's uh, Astounding Tales of Space and Time. And shortly thereafter, um, uh, Hall of Fame was published now, it was earlier, but I was unaware of hardbacks and all that other kinds of stuff. And I picked up a copy of this probably at a Walden's Books uh, somewhere in uh, New Jersey, and uh, it confirmed my my idea that buying anthologies was an extremely rewarding experience because I would end up with 20 or 30 names that I could determine I liked or I didn't like, and then I could go back to the bookshelves and find works by those people, knowing that I would get some kind of a, of a good read. Now, Cora, when did you, have you read this book before or you read the stories uh, individually? I've read uh, most of the stories at some point, but I've not actually read this anthology because it was published before I was born. So, um, was a, and of course it's been reprinted a couple of times, but somehow it never crossed, uh, crossed my orbit when I was uh, like Steve, a kid hanging out in the, and of course in Germany, it was even more difficult because, uh, because, okay, um, I mean, uh, there was a lot of, there was, there was homegrown science fiction, there were translations, there were mostly in these little, little magazine type things, things, uh, Terra and Utopia were the names of those mm. lines. The translations were often abbreviated, um, the quality was variable, variable, occasionally the, the translator managed to give the twist away in the title, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very yeah, thank you very much, Walter Ernsting, for that one. <laughs> so um, I you had to go to the import bookstore. We only had one in town, and it had uh, I think two spinner racks of paperbacks, which were a mix of there was a few roman romances. Okay, didn't care about those. There were mysteries. Yes, yeah, sometimes and there was science fiction and fantasy. And um, I basically went through it, looked at the grab whatever looked exciting, looked at the blurb. 
after a while I figured out some authors were good. Asimov was one of them. Well, with them I discovered like, okay, this one's good. And also my first Heinlein was also Starman Jones, picked up from that spinner rack at Storm at uh, Stormbücher. Stormbücher still exists, but it's much smaller now than it used to be. And it's basically just a, just a store for art books and uh, so, but they also they has still had a lot of art books, but that huge foreign language section back then, then to cater to university students. It was way before Amazon. So basically, it was yes, it was me and was usually a lot of university students, students often boys who were always very very interested in what I was reading, which I found very very annoying. Like, what are these guys looking at? Are they judging me for my reading? I was a little bit stupid, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so. Yeah, I mean, if you're 15, 16 and uh, quite cute and there's a boy of maybe 18 or 19 looking at you, he's probably, well, he was probably checking out what I was reading, but, but it wasn't like, but really, but it wasn't like, okay, the guy who's buying the math book is uh, curious what I'm reading. And uh, how did I find out about authors which were interesting to read without uh, scoring the bookstore store and uh, because and everything else you had a special order? Well, I found the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. The first, the old, I have the first two editions. Editions because when I knew, it was hugely expensive. I think it took up a lot of my, my, it was a big hardcover. And there's a, there's a picture of Metropolis on the cover, which is, of mm -hmm. course, a good thing. Good thing. And uh, it took up my, my, a lot of pocket money, Christmas money, birthday money, Freimarkt, which is our autumn fan. If there's Freimarkt, your grandparents will give you, will give you some money to go on the rides. I didn't go on the rides. I saved them. I saved my money and um, report card money. So it was a lot of money Ridic uh, for a kid, ridiculous amount of money. I dropped on this book, which I found not at the Storm bookstore, but at a shop in uh, in Rotterdam called the Bayen, the Bayen Corp, uh, the Beehive, which is a high-end department store with a very good book department, including lots of English language books. So yeah, I had, this, I had the encyclopedia of science fiction. I read through it. I made notes of, okay, this sounds interesting. This sounds interesting. And then tried to track down the books. And that's okay. how I, and that's how I found uh, actually a lot of these stories, uh, stories at some, at some point in some context, context. There were very few where I thought like, okay, um, I don't, I've never read this one before. Right. And um, you're, we're going to lean heavily on your knowledge of, of old school science fiction as we get through it. One thing I want to say right off the bat before, as we're starting this series on this book of the science fiction hall of fame, before we really get into it, um, I think it's time for, to redo the science fiction hall of fame right around the time of the centennial. And the way I would do it is to give each decade its own like hall of fame volume volume right and because and i'm going to break down these numbers this research was done by a, a young researcher in 2014 by the name of steve davidson uh who i get these numbers from um so thank you steve for this work because you broke down for example the decades now all these stories come from 1934 to 1963 is the most recent right. in this volume yeah I there mean, are... uh, it makes sense. The nebula started up in 1965. Oh, yeah. Right. So... <laughs> right. The 30s only are represented by three stories. Okay. The 40s by 10 stories. The 50s by 12. And one from the 60s, from, from the first couple of years of the 60s. So um, I know that all three of us agree you could do a whole book of 30 science fiction and and represent it. I did a whole mini series on this podcast about 30 science fiction and uh, some of the ones that, you know, I chose to cover Catherine Lucille Moore, Sam Blow, um, Lovecraft's at the Mountains of Madness. Mm. Um you know, this book has Campbell with Twilight, but who goes there is arguably more important. And um, we also covered Alas, All Thinking by Harry Bates and um, Clifford Samak's, um, oh, the football one. I'm trying, I'm brain farting the name, but and Samak's represented here. So not with, uh, not with the story I would have chosen, but okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's a, I, I, this is one of the really baffling one choices, I think, because there's a much better story 
story actually from the same same series. <laughs> right. Well, I would have chosen other Samax as well, but um, the the um, the point is is that the '30s had a, a lot more science fiction going on, especially um, just weird tales alone. <laughs> Right. Um, There's not a single story from Weird Tales in here, which is no. my which is ridiculous. Yeah. Because um, uh, Amazing was the first science fiction magazine, and that's what it will always be. But Weird Tales was the first speculative fiction magazine magazine because they did uh, they did uh, fantasy and horror as well. Also, we're oh, missing yeah. the entire twenties, and we're yeah. missing the nineteen teens and everything before. We could go back to nineteen. Well, I see we could go back to. But before 1900, it gets a little bit uh, thin in the ground. So really no quickly, do you guys have picks for the 1920s that you think would have represented this, starting with Steve? Um, no, but I, I had two things that I that I wanted to point out that are kind of offline a little bit, and then I'll get back to that. Okay. First, first uh, Cora's account, to me, exemplifies uh, the persistence of science fiction fans, yeah, uh, where we're a non-proselytizing organization, we all have to find our own way, and the ones that stay in this are the ones that exhibit that kind of persistence. So good, good for you, Cora. Um, <laughs> and the other thing was that actually there was a magazine called the Thrill Book, which oh yes. Mm -hmm world tales it only had a couple of issues and it was very unfocused but it was also kind of trying to cover the the macabre and the and the outlandish and the 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 weird and the horror kind of uh speculative genres um no i don't have any particular um specific recommendations um i might have a list if um i had known that i was going to be asked that question <laughs> Right. Uh, Sorry to hit you with that. No, one. that no, that's that's perfectly okay. I, I'm I'm explaining myself rather than complaining about the question. <laughs> um, but uh, I do think that one thing that is potentially problematic with probably the 20s through the 40s um, is that while I do not believe that most of them were written deliberately to express various uh, concepts that we have difficulties with these days, um, such as casual misogyny and, uh, and racism and whatnot. Um, they are very much present and an assumption of the background that the authors wrote from, and they, they can be problematic because modern readers uh, don't for the large for, for large measure in my opinion don't seem to be able to read something and accept it from within the context with which it was written as opposed to trying to apply modern day values and well, whatnot to a particular story but I mean if you pick up an anthology of science fiction from the 1920s or 19 teens uh, you have to you have to accept that some attitudes will be outdated I mean there are two terribly terribly sexist stories in this one. This one, one, so one that I honestly think, why did they pick this one? There are better stories from the same author available. The other one, like, okay, it's a classic, it's still sexist. And one is, and there's also some racist stuff in here. It's not actually that bad, that bad. There's worse, but um but Which yes, you, you have some you will always run across these attitudes. I know a lot of people are not willing to get past these. Which these stories old, are you? These old attitudes. You can call out the stories. I, I, I. Which one? The sexist one. Coming attractions by, by um, <laughs> Leiber. Why did they pick that one? It's, it's terribly sexist. And Leiber is a great writer. He shouldn't be represented by this story. Okay. Of course, when I tried to find alternatives, most of them were like, okay, this is good, but it's fantasy or it's horror. However, it was a bit difficult deciding on a science. Science fiction because Leiber was more a fantasy and horror guy than he was a sign. He did write a lot of science fiction, but his fantasy and horror was simply better. He was actually mostly a horror guy. And then Helen he O'Loy, won... I know it's a classic, but it's sexist. And also, why is Helen O'Loy pretty much the only robot story in this? Uh, the entire genre of robot stories is represented by Helen O'Loy. Yeah, not my choice, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm 
currently trying to put together a panel for that one and it, it <laughs> no yeah. one wants it <laughs> okay well, it's not neither are the worst no okay and of course we also have uh, the code equations which has always been called a sexist story it kind of it's not really um i wouldn't say it's really a sexist story and i that absolutely deserves to be here because every story we st are still arguing about and trying to rebut more than yeah. 60 years after it was written deserves to be it's almost 70 years now now, yeah. every story that people have been discussing and rebutting for so long deserves to be there. I've rebutted it myself. Everybody, I think, has done it at some point. Right. Well, and yeah, and it's funny because Lieber won the Hugo for The Wanderer, which was oh, God. A, <laughs> Sorry. A terrible, terrible, <laughs> terrible book. <laughs> And I think it's one of the worst Hugo. Every it's a the it is the worst. Least like no, Hugo no, all no, time. no. The uh, <laughs> the the second one to win. Who's yes, uh, which is why I said the second least liked one because uh, what's it called? They'd rather be right is apparently worse. But most people haven't read it because it's been out of print for ages. But uh, the, but more people have read the, the Liber and. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even people who like him are like, oh, it's a liar. How bad can it be? Yes, it is it can be bad. bad. So he's, he, he was great. He's a great writer. And most of his Hugo winners are great stories. Stories. Yeah. I mean, um, Ilmet and Lankma is one of the, is probably one of my favorite Hugo winners of all time. It's fantasy, of course, but it's a great, mm -hmm. great story. All right. And well, his other, but this one is just, that one's just, nope. I want to transition into this story pretty soon, but let's talk about like the editors who, who did these stories because there's one of the things about this book that's a negative is the extreme bias towards John W. Campbell stories. There's 13 John W. Campbell stories in here. Uh, so there's 13 astound stories that came from Astounding, which, you know, is what it is but uh that's a lot there's five stories that came from the magazine of fantasy and science fiction they had different editors during the times that these stories were selected so a couple of them are, are boucher and mccullough stories and a couple of them are um avron davidson avron davidson yeah avron davidson like stories um working on getting um avron's son on dickheads soon so Everybody look out for that. And we're going to be covering uh, Grania Davis's Dr. Grass, which is a hilarious wow. looking book. Um, it's coming up soon on, on Dickheads. Well, we do, we do nothing soon on Dickheads. Everything takes time. <laughs> um, uh, fantasy book had one story from William and Margaret Crawford, editor. Mm -hmm. uh, two galaxy stories from, from Gold, Horace Gold. Uh, one story from New Tales of Space and Time, um raymond j healy uh one planet stories two frederick paul stories and then of course this one came from wonder stories edited right. by charles d horny yeah yep. so the, uh, uh, the 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 young the young fan editor who was brought in by gurns back yeah based on letters he had written to the magazine and the thing about Horn, Horn, this interesting role is you still see a lot of the essays and a lot of the work being done by Gernsbeck in this this issue. So if, if you look at the issue, before we start talking about the actual issue, because I'm going to share, for those of you who are listening on audio only, um, the, the thing is, is that I, I am going to pull up on the screen for the YouTube, the, the issue, so we can look at the table of contents a little bit here. A little bit, but let's talk about 1934 for a second, um, because this story came out in 1934. Um, my father died in his 80s. He was born in 1936. That is my context for for this. Um, I always think of 1936 as the year Raiders of the Lost Ark took place. So, um, you know, 1934 is a long time ago, right? And so what kind what was going on in 1934 well you had the dust bowl in the united states yeah. bonnie and clyde got gunned down hitler came to power in 1930. no actually he came to power in 1933 but in 19 he was already he'd been in power for over a year but um he was still con he was still consolidating dating right. his power i think the reichstag burned in 1934 so 
So it was, um, so yes, things were already yeah. were not good, but they were about to get a lot worse. <laughs> right. Well, it was all bad. Germany also built the first TVs in 1934. Um, so there's that. And then um, the first international airmail yeah. was, was sent in 1934. These are things, so there was, yeah, this was before TV. I mean, radio was, was a thing. That's new. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there was no regular transatlantic flights. Uh, well, we there had were transatlantic the, the flights. Transatlantic there... line. It was the golden age of the ocean liner. We had right. beautiful ocean liners. Uh, I think the, the Ile de France or the, Norm no, the Normandy was later. It must have been the Ile de France or the Normandy. One of the French ones was, uh, was launched in 1934. So we had, so you could, of course, travel across the Atlantic. You had wonderful ways to get there. You could get a, take a beautiful, luxurious ocean liner. At least if you, I mean, they were also, it, at this point, they were also decent if you were not, if you weren't, well, if you traveled third class, they were at least decent. Decent, they were not not great. And of course, you had Zeppelins. You, yeah, could, it, cross, uh, you could cross the Atlantic on the Graf Zeppelin. And wait a minute, I think the, Hinden, no, the Hindenburg, uh, well, Hindenburg might already have been flying. I'm not quite sure. I have to look it up now. Now, Steve, in your article about this story, you listed all the things that didn't exist yet in technology. Mm -hmm. And I, I cracked up that you listed no Velcro or Teflon. Yeah, <laughs> you were very yes. This was pro. This was before Velcro, which I thought very interesting that you put Velcro on the list. Wow. However, one of the things that's very important to notice that I mean, Pluto was barely like discovered at this time. It was discovered in the 30s. In fact, it might not have even been this well. No, it, it was. I think it was 1930 or 30. It was. Uh, it was early at any rate. Yeah, it was, it was very 30. early 30s. It was new. Um. And and the reason I know this is there was a brain eaters from Pluto story in one of the, the 30, 34 <laughs> wonder stories because I was looking through all the letters to see uh -huh. the reaction for this. So I know Pluto was there. I think it was 32 Pluto was found. However, there was very little knowledge about space at all. Like, you know, what was going on comparatively to what we know now with our space telescopes, with our space stations and all everything. Well, there, was, there was no space flight. Certainly not. Yeah. Um, and so no probes, no pictures other than what they could get through ground-based uh, telescopes. So we were still under the impression that um, Mars was filled with canals and that there was probably people, there was still the opportunity or the belief that it was possible that Mars would be like loaded with life just like ours because our imagination saw Venus and Mars that way in particular. So that's why we have so many uh, amazing, Mars um, especially wow. C.L. Moore and Lee Brackett, awesome Venus and Mars yep. stories. Um, my favorite. I call it the pop science fiction shared solar system because they had a very, they had a definite idea of what yeah. the planets were. I actually did a blog post on that. They have a definite, a bit of a joke here, blog post, because they had a definite idea of what uh, the solar system they had ideas of what Mars would like, what Venus would be like, what Mercury was like. They're all. Yeah. And um, the moons of Jupiter, sometimes even the surface of Jupiter, which is kind of, and um, even further out, Pluto, up to Pluto, they had ideas of what uh, what these planets were like. But uh, most of these ideas are completely wrong. Wrong. Uh, they were they made sense from what they knew at the time. At the time, but um, basically they were all setting. They were all very similar. Martian Odyssey is actually interesting simply because it's not the, not really the mass from the pulp science fiction shared solar system. It's a different kind of mass. Well, right. to, to yeah. some degree. Now, the scientific community, is particularly the astronomical community at that time, knew that there were no canals on Mars. Uh, they had gone through the whole uh, Schiaparelli uh, thing with the canals, and um, they knew that there were no canals there. Um, but what kind of atmosphere it had, what the surface conditions were like, that was definitely still up for speculation. And I think that Weinbaum kind of slipped in. He added the canals, probably because that perception of the planet was still the very, the, the most popular vision of Mars among the general population. Oh, yes, yeah. regarding Schiaparelli, um, his, I think he's his niece or something, Elder Schiaparelli. 
was at this time the story was written. She was one of the leading fashion designers. Mm. Designers. And she did, yes, she did some very, even today, I think the Schiaparelli designs from the 1930s and so on, still in 20s, still look rather futuristic for the era they were in. So I always found, I always found it interesting that two people with this very, very um, unique name became famous in so very different <laughs> different places. Well, I just wanted to set the stage of what what we knew about Mars. Now, I want to talk about Stanley Weinbaum for a little for a little bit. And we'll come back to Wonder Stories as a magazine before we get really into the story. But Weinbaum's an interesting person. I first heard of Weinbaum through reading Robert Block's um, autobiography, The Once Around the Block. Um, and for those who don't know, Robert Block, the author of Psycho, who uh, grew up in Milwaukee, and he was a part of a fiction group in the 1930s of, of writers called the Milwaukee Fictioneers. And um, the founder of the Milwaukee uh, Fictioneers, as it were, was uh, or one of the main members, the most successful member of the Fictioneers. I'm not sure if he was a founder, but the most successful member was Stanley G. Weinbaum. And uh, Block did not join the Fictioneers until after Weinbaum's death, but he talked in his book about how Weinbaum's uh, legacy and particularly the impact of this story, uh, Martian Odyssey, loomed over that group enough that he wrote about it in his autobiography, right? And uh, and so one of the other people who was a part of the Fictioneers who was extremely influenced and the one who told Block a lot about Weinbaum was Frederick Brown, who uh, will appear later in this uh, anthology with the story Arena. Um, and uh, if Frederick Brown's a really interesting writer because he was one of the first kind of like comical science fiction writers. Mm -hmm. If you ever get a chance to read What Mad Universe by Frederick Brown, it's bananas. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying it's bananas. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a fun read. The Star Mouse also. I have not read that one. I've only read What Mad Universe, uh, to be honest. Um, the, the author photo on What Mad Universe, the first edition, because the library here in San Diego has the first edition wow. uh, from 1949. And the author photo on it is an all timer. Um, if if you can look it up and find it, I know I put the author photo on my review on my blog, so it's there. Um, but Frederick Brown was incredibly influenced by a short but powerful friendship with Stanley Weinbaum, according to Robert Block. Okay, so uh, that and that was who when I first read. Of Mars Odyssey last year, it was because I read, you know, in Robert Block's autobiography, he referred to this story as one of the most important and influential science fiction stories ever written that came out of his writers group. And that's the way he introduced it. So I was like, oh, shit, I got to go read that. Block <laughs> uh, was actually one of the authors who are really missing from this anthology. Okay, he was more of a he was more of a horror guy than a uh, than mm -hmm. a science fiction writer, but um, he did write science fiction stories. Um, he even was a writer on the original Star Trek, and he's one of the authors where you really think, okay, they couldn't find one, but he should have been in here somewhere. Yeah, and Weinbaum died at the ripe old age of thirty three, which is really you know I know it happened more, but. 33 is very young. He was born in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and he, but he went to school in Milwaukee, grew up in Milwaukee, uh, went to University of Wisconsin, Madison. And he started as a chemical engineering major, which explains a lot of his like. Um, Other stories, in particular. Yeah, how his stories use science. Um, and we're pretty good on the science for the time uh but he ended up majoring in english at the end um in 1933 he sold a non-science fiction novel called the lady dances uh which was serialized in newspapers mm -hmm. um and it's uh so he appeared to have written several romance novels as well Yes. science fiction it does not seem like he 
was uh, a died in the wool like committed science fiction writer he was just a writer uh, and that a, a lot of them back in the, in in that time frame were writing whatever they could write for a paycheck for the pulps i mean you know the pulps were legion and uh if they had a story that was a uh, not selling as science fiction, they might rework it as a Western or a mystery or a romance or something like that. And we'll get more into what the, the actual impact of this story in a little bit, because I have quotes from Asimov, Lester Del Rey, Lovecraft, and Frederick Pulp. This story, it kind of gets pole position in the Hall of Fame for a reason, because uh, a lot of writers in that era consider there to be science fiction before a Martian Odyssey and science fiction after that. It had that kind of impact on the genre. And if you think about like, you know, uh, just to use popular culture, you know, there's movies before Jaws and Star Wars and there's movies after those. Right. And they kind of changed everything for, 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 for how like movies were you know they became the blockbusters so you now you gotta have uh, yeah. also um uh, two also 2001 a space odyssey is another one for science fiction a movie yeah. that's before and after simply because um because uh, it looked so much better special effects and everything wise and everything that had come before yes. that everything after had to measure up to it similar to how star wars was <laughs> yeah and so i think the impact of this story i i and and I think even Robert Block was trying to articulate this in his autobiography is that the impact that Weinbaum had, it's interesting because he doesn't have like a huge catalog of stories and right. and and novels. Like there's not a lot out there because he died at 33. But this story was like a meg a 10 megaton bomb, like on the genre, because nobody had written aliens like this before that was the big change right so i think that's the impact that he had he did he did write other speculative fiction there's one uh he wrote an apocalypse uh fix up or, or a novel that got turned into it's two two novellas that got turned into a novel called the black, black flame, flame. Yeah. yeah um it's on my list because it sounds like right up my alley i love weird end of the world novels so um <laughs> So I intend to read that. So he did that. I think he intended to do more science fiction. Oh, yeah. But, um, you know, his impact here, it, it's funny, too, because according to, you know, the research that I read, like, um, he was just as shocked. At, well, he was shocked that the story had that big of an impact. He He, you know, but really... Most of the impact of it, most of the circulating out of the story happened after he died, yeah. you know? So he, like, didn't really see most of how this became, like, because the impact was, you know, slow back then, you know? Because the main way it impacted the community was it changed how writers were writing stories. And thinking about stories. Yes. Um, they did uh, the field many people in the field did a memorial anthology for him, uh, which obviously came after he was gone. Um, yeah. I, I think you're correct that he was unaware uh, of, of how deep an impact he would have. And one of the things that I like to speculate on, and I think that somebody who's a better writer than me uh, might find some fertile ground in, would be uh, a story about the science fiction field if Weinbaum had not passed so early. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, that would be interesting. And, you know, um, one of, I don't remember which story, but one of the five stories from the 30s series that I did was in an issue that had all kinds of tributes to Stanley Weinbaum in it. And I remember in our episode, we, I, I, we highlighted some of those tributes and I probably should have found that and gone mm -hmm. back and figured out which one it was. But um, in any case, um, let's, let's talk about wonder yes. story. Well, well um, yes, before, sorry. because um, I mean, there are a couple of, there are a couple of um, authors that we lost to young. Some of them are in this anthology. 
Silicon Corn Blues, we lost way too young, Henry Kuttner. And, uh, but um, the two, I think, who really, uh, who we not only lost way too young, young, but who also had a massive impact after the death that they never lived to see are Robert E. Howard and Stanley Weinbaum. They yeah. died at Weinbaum at 33, Howard at 30, 30, and, um, and Love, okay, Lovecraft, we also, he was a little older, but we also lost him too soon, and he also didn't really get to see the impact he had. So these are the people who really never saw the impact they, they had on the genre. genre and, Howard uh, was only They would 30? have loved to see the stories they could have they could have written if they had lived. Robert Howard was only 30 when he died. Wow. Yeah, he was 30. He was 30 and he'd written... Uh, written um uh, he was ex he started very early and was very prolific so weinbaum was not as prolific and he didn't start, at least we don't not that we know it he didn't start that early so <laughs> that's why we have so much Howard because he was so very very prolific yeah i'll uh, I'll, I'll toss h beam piper onto that pile oh he yes that's another one who died way too soon he, he committed suicide believing that he was a complete failure as an author <laughs> Um, I and I admit I'm not familiar with this author. So um, um, you are Little familiar Little with uh, with uh, some of the. You are familiar with this most famous creation. Believe me, you have uh, seen. You are familiar with the little fuzzy, so you probably know. Oh, people. the little fuzzy. Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Yes, I. Am He's here. the guy who invented what became the Evox. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. Let me share a screen with. The people who are watching on YouTube, uh, they can see my very dirty desktop for a second. Um, okay. Uh, that's nothing, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is the table of contents in the um, 19, July 1934 issue of Wonder Stories. Um, and uh, when you're doing research for stories like this, and this time, you also have to read the next two issues letters to really see <laughs> uh, what people were thinking. And um, Martian Odyssey was immediately a fan favorite. There were several letters calling for sequels and more stories like it, um, including, you know, letters from Oklahoma and, uh, you know, uh, Washington State. And, uh, you know, so it just kind of showed, like, I, I thought that was kind of neat. Um, so these are the, uh, we start with an editorial by Gernsback. Um, now this was a fan edited issue. I think um, really Wait, none oh, of yeah. these other stories are ones that I remember hearing of. I don't really know many of these other than Endo um, Binder. Yeah, Endo Binder is the only one who's, um, who, well, Go yeah. to who is remembered these days. The other ones yeah. I've never heard a, of them. I would yeah. love to know who did the rocket ships news article because it might have been Willy Lai. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. We he was that... writing articles for he was writing articles for I think it might have been Wonder Stories. I don't know which magazine. He was one of the American science fiction magazines. He was writing articles about rocket ships and early rocket experiments for them in the 1930s when he was living in Germany. And then one day the Gestapo knocked on his door and said, said, uh, well, you've been writing these articles for foreign publications. And he said, uh, well, science fiction, and we'll all go to the moon together, blah, blah. And they said, you can't do this. Do this. It's classified knowledge. And then Lai said, well, can I at least write stories? And they said, no, you can't write science fiction stories. So Lai said, well, bye bye then and <laughs> took off to the US. Good for him. And uh, later on, of course, all his old friends from the from the Raketen Club uh, showed up uh, up and they all built and they all worked at NASA together. So this might actually have been one of his. <laughs> yep. Right. And and so what Oh what, Philip Wiley is there, but it's just a book review because he's yeah. another one who's actually remembered. Right. Well, um the an endo binder like that, it was the it, it was part one of a three part um, serialization of a novel and that novel got reprinted many many times um, and if people don't know Endo Binder was a, a pen name for two brothers yep E cool. and O <laughs> yeah and uh, they're they're probably the only other <clears throat> writers of Supergirl right and later comic writers and right. uh, Adam Link robot stories and Adam there's Link, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, 
what do you guys know about the history of Wonder Stories? It was a spinoff of Astounding, correct? Yeah, no. amazing. Or amazing. No, um, Gernsback lost <laughs> Amazing and his publishing empire in 29. And within six months, he had uh, two new science fiction magazines out on the stands, uh, Science Wonder Stories and Air Wonder Stories. Um, Air Wonder, after a very few issues, was merged into Science Wonder Stories, which then changed its name to Wonder Stories and was eventually sold in 36 to become Thrilling Wonder Stories. Now, I do want to look at Enslaved Brains for a second, the Endo Binder, <laughs> because this is the this art is the amazing, thrilling it's world. It's like Paul. He's my he's a birthday buddy of mine. We share a burst. I share a birthday with uh, a birthday with Frank Apoll. <laughs> and I, I love how it says here, um, we are shown the effects of civilization of 1973 would have on man lost in the jungle. So this is like. <laughs> Okay. The wonderful future of 1973. Uh, hey, I was just born. Only yeah. the world didn't look like that. I mean, I kind of miss my beautiful flying wings or whatever those things are. Yeah. Uh, I, I This is one of my favorite things that I, I saw <laughs> flipping through the issue. Um, you can see this is the cover. And Steve, you've got a version of the cover there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh. and there's the free radio catalog ad, <laughs> which is great. Chris Back was, was still very heavily into radio and also television at the time. He had the Radio League of America, I believe it was called, which actually petitioned Congress successfully to get a carve out for amateur radio. All the, all the ham radios owe their ability to have... Uh, part of the radio spectrum devoted to them to uh, Gerns back in the radio league. Yeah. And it appears that the cover has some kind of hyper tube that will take you New York to Sydney, um, which is awesome. I'm still waiting for the hyper tube. Yeah. That would be lovely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, I mean, the Frank Apoll art still has an impact today. I mean, you still see, um, if you've seen it was which one was it was one of the Star Wars prequels. I think the the second one, Attack of the Clones. There's pretty much uh, these large yes. uh, circular things, which as and they've shown up elsewhere. These large circular sort of motorcycles cycles. When they when I was in the cinema watching Attack of the Clones, I screamed like, Oh my God! It's this it's this a it's a, a Frank Paul cycle, and everybody was like, What is this crazy person doing? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about Frank R. Paul. Uh, he was the art art. He was Gernsback's like probably number one artist. Go to guy, yeah. His go to guy. So a lot of the art from the '30s uh, science fiction is uh, is his, and um, and one of uh, the greats. <laughs> yeah, one of the greats. Yeah, uh, for the '30s, it's uh, basically it's basically Frank R. Paul and. Uh, Margaret Brandeis, who are the most impactful science fiction and fantasy illustrators of very different, very, very, very differently different works. Here's a like, like, uh, have... <laughs> new readers get acquainted with science fiction. <laughs> I've, I've uh, just started quoting each paragraph individually on Facebook as <laughs> a uh, uh, a public science fiction uh, announcement. That's awesome. Uh, this is to explain what science fiction is. I like how it's habit forming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it kind of is, <laughs> but I, I I always love these ancient articles. Oh yes, there we have it. And then here's uh, Twill. Twill, yes. Jarvis. Jarvis. Yeah. Um, and this of art course. is great. This art is fantastic. Of course, um, we we don't know that his name is really Tweel. It might be Peru -pe -pe uh, or something else. Well, oh, Jarvis calls him Tweel. <laughs> one th one last thing I want to say about Frank R. Paul and his art is that I saw a quote here saying that the first science fiction images seen by Ray Bradbury, Arthur C. Clarke, Forrest J. Ackerman was his art. So you know that's it's an interesting way to put it, but. Um, 
It's all right. From that era, it was either Frank or Paul or you'd see Metropolis, <laughs> if you've been lucky enough to yeah. see it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a surprising number of our uh, founding generation of authors were first exposed to the genre, either through amazing or uh, science wonder stories. Uh, I have a piece on the website about uh, where did you first get exposed to science fiction? And it goes through a list of people like um, Asimov and Pohl and et cetera, and listing their first uh, magazine by by issue. Yeah. So, um, and again, I apologize to the audio listeners who audio only listeners. This is one part where you might want to go over to the YouTube um, uh, because we've got the uh, original appearance of uh, Martian Odyssey up on the screen, which has this amazing um, artwork, this uh, really great drawing of. Um, Tweel being like an ostrich-like character, and I did not see Tweel that way really in my head until I saw that picture. Now I can't get it out of my head. It makes I think makes the story like ten times better, too. Um, but uh, one thing I should note, and this was an unintentional, uh, you know, retroactively, I'm going to say it's an homage. But my science fiction novel, Goddamn Killing Machines, the main character's name is Nick Jarvis. So I'm going to say that that's a uh, homage to a Martian Odyssey that I hadn't read yet uh, when I wrote it. So, uh, but Jarvis is our main character. He's um, he's one of the scientists. He's the chemist, I believe. Of the yeah, chemist of the of the crew, which is a nod to Weinbaum's chemical engineering degree, apparently, um, and probably uh, you know. Um, but let's see what um, this uh, um, what Actually, the editorial. What's really interesting about this crew is the spaceship crew. Is that it's an international crew? We have two. Uh, we have two um, possibly American or maybe British characters, Harrison and Jarvis. We have yeah. um, uh, German German character Schatz, who also speaks German a few times. Times well, at least he thinks. I uh, think it's probably likely very influenced by Yiddish because uh, some of this doesn't work in German. German, and then we have a French character, Leroy or Leroy or whatever he calls himself, which is quite interesting for a story from 1934 to have an international crew. Yes, and yeah. <laughs> let's 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 look at what um, the because each Wonder Stories comes with a little editorial comment. Um, that's how we got that cool thing about 1973 and the endo binder one um i'm not gonna read the whole thing but i'll read parts of it it is most curious thing this is how it starts no doubt one of the greatest wonders of our wonder stories that practically all authors have an idea that future explorers will step into another world and find conditions like they are on earth they picture human beings with two feet two legs two eyes just as we have them here although the chances are not one in a million that such conditions will even remotely prevail. Biologists are pretty much unanimous on this point and feel that if there is such a thing as intelligent life on Mars or Venus, it certainly will be radically different from human life here that we that we know here. So then, uh, but toward the bottom, it says, our present author, fully conscious of this thought, has written a science fiction tale so new, so breezy, that it stands on its head and shoulders over similar interplanetary stories. The, the mere fact that he keeps you guessing is the main charm of the story. And with this coupled with a lighter vein in which it is written makes it all the more charming. We are prevailing upon the author to let us have a sequel, which we hope to present soon. Oops. Uh, that did not happen. But Yeah, the uh, sequel to this Valley of Dreams. Is the sequel oh, to Martian Odyssey? Is it? I did. Yes. I did not even know that such a thing existed. I thought he died right after writing this, but no. Now you have he the lived wonderful for another year or so. Oh, okay. Wonderful opportunity of being able to visit with Tweel again. Excellent. Well, now I get to do that. Um, so yeah, um, interesting introduction. I think they knew what they had on their hands, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, Gunsberg had been editing science fiction since for eight years now. 
Actually, uh, if you think of his other magazines, he'd been editing science fiction before that. He knew this was something very different from what you usually get. Uh, I, I think he also knew that it, it exemplified exactly what he was trying to achieve with science fiction in terms of making it both uh, entertaining and educational. Right. And eventually, John W. Campbell would come up with this saying where he says, write me a creature who thinks as well as a man, sexist, but whatever, uh, or better than a man, but not like a man, you know, uh, and I think it was already done here, but um, sexism. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty wording. sure that, that this story is what Campbell had in mind when he said that quote. Yeah. Campbell so, was very, very likely to it. So Asimov said, as one of three stories that changed the way all subsequent stories in the science fiction genre have been written, I'm not sure what other two stories he's referring to, but <clears throat> one of them might have been his own, um, and maybe he was being humble about that. Uh, Lester Del Rey said, Weinbaum, more than any other writer, helped to take our field out of the doldrums of the early 30s into the beginnings of modern science fiction. Lovecraft said... Weinbaum's writing was ingenious and that he stood miles above the other Pulp Fiction writers in the creation of genuinely alien worlds. In contrast to Edgar Rice Burroughs and his inane stories of egg laying princesses. What Lovecraft said. And Frederick Paul said before Weinbaum, science fiction's aliens might be cat men, lizard men, ant men, plant men, or rock men, but they were always incurably men. Weinbaum changed that. It was the difference in orientation and drives, goals, and thought processes that made Weinbaum types types of aliens so fresh and rewarding to science fiction in the mid-30s. So those are pretty interesting quotes. Um, what did you guys think? Uh, now, when did you first read this story, Steve? Um, when I was 10 or 11 back in 1970 or, or maybe, yeah, right around that time. And Cora, when did you first read this story? Must have been about 30 years ago or so. I was in my, as a, when I, I found it fairly early in my science fiction journey, journey in some kind of anthology of, uh, of best of stories. Admittedly, I read it last year. Okay. <laughs> the first time. <laughs> This was my second time reading it for for this purpose. Um, also, come to single since you said that Frederick Brown was strongly influenced by Weinbaum. Um, I can absolutely see this now. I didn't know this before, but um, having read uh, some some Brown, I can absolutely see the influence. Yeah, well, and there there's a touch of humor. Yeah, particularly the uh, the ending. And wouldn't surprise me at all if the two, Weinbaum and uh, Brown, uh, that was what brought them together as, as authors. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then, uh, hold on, let me stop share. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think what, what what struck me reading it last year, and I read it because of Robert Block mentioning it, and um, because he made it, you know, he correctly said it was so important. I was like, hey, now I got to know what the, what the story is. Um, yeah, it struck me for 1934. It's so advanced in its thinking for the time. And it's obvious when you're reading it right away, like this is not this is way ahead of its time, you know. But a lot of the classics that we have highlighted on, on this show you know, are all way ahead of their time for the 30s. So um, it's fair to say that there was more going on in the 30s and people were realizing, I think, from our older perspective, you know, it's uh, most of the, yeah. the entire golden age, radium age, silver age, new wave era. There's always more going on than you think. Several different um there's always stories which are way ahead of the time and stories which are way beyond, way back in the times. I mean, Edgar yeah. Rice Burroughs got his first and only posthumous Hugo nomination in the mid 1960s for Pelosi Dar story, which had been rediscovered and reprinted, <laughs> reprinted, which is uh, and 
which is uh, and both is someone you you associate with the nineteen teens and twenties, way before Martian Odyssey. Yeah, yeah, and I think the impact of this story, um, well, you know, obviously, I mean, a lot of authors have made direct homages to to this story, the ones that had gone over my head before, but. Um, and I know uh, an actual valley in Mars was named after um, something from the story or, or a dedication to Weinbaum, I I think. Uh, and uh, I read that somewhere. And, and you know, when you look at the impact of what what's going on in this story is, is that, yeah, it's a little dated now if you look at it by today's standards. But, you know, you the three of us all like to read old science fiction not for how it lines up with today, but where I think if you're reading 1930 science fiction, you kind of have to put yourself in the head space of, of the time. And if you do that, you're going to be really rewarded with a, a really clever story that is, is fun, entertaining, and it has, you know, kind of a wry sense of humor, you know, and it has really cool ideas. You got tentacle creatures, you got bird-like creatures. And I, definitely think that you know the fact that the brick the brick, uh, the brick, brick, brick is yeah. <laughs> the pyramid creature yeah and mars pyramids and you got uh you know the fact that silicon based no... life forms i think yes. this might be the first silicon based life form in science fiction at any rate i don't know of any earlier example and uh there's no universal translator so like they have to like you know learn to communicate it does happen a little quickly but, makes uh, my linguist heart happy <laughs> yeah <laughs> right and i don't know that i don't know how much that was done before this point because i'm not a, an expert on what was there what wasn't no, there mo mo most of it was the aliens possessed the technology that allowed them where they had been studying us for ages and picked up our language or they had mental telepathy of some kind that allowed them to communicate without having to go through the whole yeah. translation thing. Yeah, people were just trying to cheat it. <laughs> oh. Right. And which is fine. The, you you uh, know, you want uh, that every once in a while, but like, you know, oh, it's good to I see mean, the hard stuff start. I think John Carter actually has to learn the Martian language, but we don't really get to see much of it. That's true. That right. that does happen to John Carter <laughs> because yeah. that's really uh, because that's basically just a bit that uh, balls jumps over. Yeah, no, no magical elixir. elixir. No, they don't have. I mean, um, he has, he still Bell still has magical travel to Mars. <laughs> At least by this point, they had rockets. Magical travel, yes, but no, not uh, magical. Not elixir. magic, but they don't have tele. They don't have magical universal translators. Right. Right. Uh, one one thing that uh, I'd like to point out, uh, I don't know if you were planning on getting to it later, but one of the unique things about this story is that Weinbaum pulls you through the landscape along with Tweel and Jarvis. He does not Absolutely. message any of the description by giving you a long exposition. And, and you mentioned Burroughs. Burroughs does that with as he's introducing the creatures and the, the places and the things that are on Barsoom. Here, you are literally experiencing these vistas and these creatures and these new things as the character is experiencing them and in the same fashion that he does. We have limited knowledge. We don't know what's going on. Everything is a mystery. And it might or might not be explained later on in the story, just as if you were experiencing an alien landscape yourself for the first time. And I think that is one of the strongest elements of this story. Absolutely. Yeah, I think... Um, I think the alien is the thing that I focused on, like Tweel in the in the character for a lot of it but um you know and it's funny too because when the pyramids showed up it was you know my reaction is reading it was oh that's cool you know <laughs> just like you know um that's just like a fun neat little part of it and um you know but and i'm trying to keep these episodes to an hour and a half so i'm gonna start to and 
I knew this episode would focus more on like the process of the Hall of Fame and this story mm-hmm. probably isn't going to get the attention it deserves because the other episodes are going to be a little bit more on on the actual stories than, mm-hmm. than this one was. But I also think that I, I really wanted to get into who Weinbaum was as a person because that that's it's really sad that he died at 30, 33 yeah. years old. That we didn't get to see. Uh and and who knows, he may have written more romance romance novels than he did science. <laughs> Maybe he would have made his I mean you never know. He might have uh, say he might have gone made his mark elsewhere, but I think he but I think if he'd lived a few years longer, he would have been one of um, John W. Campbell's uh, stable of astounding writers, because this is very much uh, this is very much an astounding story at a time when astounding already existed, but wasn't yet the astounding we know today. Today it wasn't uh, because um, because the astounding we know is mostly Campbell's astounding. Astounding and, and we don't and really and pay much attention to the astounding of 1930 to 1930. What was it? Uh, Seven, yes, Four. I think. Um, yeah, but and, astounding was not nearly as influential during this period of time as it became. Yeah, uh, it was just one of many similar pulp SF magazines uh, uh, on the stands at the time. Now, speaking of of, of your magazines, Steve, uh, in 1932, Amazing Stories published an endo binder story called "The First Martian." Has mm-hmm. anybody read that one? Because um, I think uh, some people thought that this was that that story was like a, an earlier attempt to do some of the same stuff, but wasn't as successful. It didn't. Uh, I, I'm I'm not familiar with that. I I have a, a fair number of uh, the Binders uh, stories, but I'm not familiar with that one. I'm sorry. Yeah, that... I I'm only just you know, I, well. I it was mentioned in one of the letters about martian odyssey um that basically they said this was a the martian odyssey was a more successful like version of that kind of thing. yeah and so it's funny because this is the one that everybody remembers and i've never heard of the endo binder one until i saw it in a letter from apparently a reader in oklahoma that's what i have in my notes okay <laughs> um, yeah, i always love these these letters especially since i give uh, often give um give city and state names and if someone has an unusual name, you can look them up. I actually did this once with a with a quite very very famous letter to Weird Tales about from a fan complaining about a, about a C.L. Moore Zero of Laurie story. So it was the first one I think Black Girl. Well, we don't want this women women. And this letter is it's quoted over and over again about Weird Tales. Le- Weird Tales readers didn't want want these stories by women. It completely ignores that the, that the writer of the letter says that he loved the Northwest Smith stories, which were also by C.L. Moore. Uh-huh. Moore. Of course, they didn't. he didn't know if she was a woman. And actually, this guy had a unique name, an unusual place where he came from. So I actually Googled him and uh, found some and found the letter quoted over and over again. But I also <laughs> found an entry on an ancestry site or find a grave or something like this. And it turned out he was 14 years old when he wrote that letter. Okay, so here's a 14-year-old boy from a place in somewhere in Pennsylvania, Vania, um, who was a who was a radio <laughs> amateur and uh, things writing a letter to Vettel saying, "I want more North with Smith, I want more Conan, I don't want this women stuff, this this girly stuff here." Which is like, yes, he's 14, of course he he wants more Conan. Who wouldn't if who, which 14-year-old boy wouldn't? But everybody is quoting. Everybody has quoted this letter all over again as, oh, this is what we, readers of Weird Tales were thinking. Even though well, they obviously weren't in the same issue, and B, no one ever checked this guy out out to put his comments into perspective. Well, you know, it was an eighth grade Philip K. Deck writing to Steve's magazine, Amazing Stories, in 1944. Yeah, I love with, the finding these things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Philip K. Dick wrote a letter and how that was how when I went to Berkeley, we found one of his houses that n- none of the researchers knew that he lived in before. Um, cool. uh, I believe it was um, uh, SSF Audio, who uh, Jesse, who sent me the a copy of the letter and said, hey, do you know about this house? And then we found the house that he lived in only for two years uh, with his mother because the letter was in the back of amazing stories and in 1944 and by the way we got to the 
the neighbor was coming out to take out the trash and saw David Gill and I standing on the street, like looking like weirdos. <laughs> and he was apparently a dickhead. So we started talking to him and he had the lady told the lady, he was like, yeah, I know her. And we ended up talking to the lady that lived in the house and she had lived in the house since the sixties and had no idea that this famous writer had lived in her house for two years and was very thankful that these two weirdos were standing outside of her house and let her know <laughs> that this uh, famous author lived in I mean, her house. Some of these houses eventually get turned into museums. Um, so he has saved the birthplace of the Bronte sisters in, uh, in uh, what's it called? Thornton, I think, Thornton in Yorkshire. And of course, um, the Robert E. Howard Museum is a, yeah. how, a house, is a museum now. <laughs> There's a family living in the Francisco house that Phil lived in during the fifties. Um, and that's the one that I went up and touched the house. I felt really creepy about it, but uh, <laughs> that's, that was where the bathroom that inspired uh, uh time out of joint and like with the light switch and, and, and then all that. And it's, he wrote, uh, the people that know that you, that uh, they, the did... people that live there, They've lived there for 10 years. They know it's Phil's house. They oh, asked, yeah. So they, they probably asked, know because they have dickheads uh, in yeah, front of they, the house all the time. They put the kibosh on a on, on a, 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 sta a little plaque being put plaque on the outside. Yeah. They didn't want that. Um, there's a plaque outside of Anthony Boucher's house, by the way. Uh, can you, can you imagine the concerned call to the police? Yeah, there's a bunch of dickheads outside my house. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, but the Francisco house is one that I think one day I hope somebody buys that house and turns it into a museum because uh, he wrote everything in the 50s, all of his short stories in the 50s, all of his novels uh, in that house. That's the house he was living in when they were um, getting food from the pet store uh, famously, which is now a karate dojo. Now, the pet food <laughs> store is, is that the karate house, dojo. Dude? Is that the house uh, he was in when the whole uh, FBI is following me? And no? no, 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 that was no, that was Marin County. Uh, but okay. uh, no, this is the house he lived in with Cleo in the fifties, and um, um, you know he wrote uh, Solar Lottery, The Man Who Japed, like all the fifties stuff. So it's because yeah. Philip K. Dick is another author we lost. Uh, well, he lived longer than Weinbaum or Howard and so on, but we lost yeah. him too soon. And he also didn't get to see the impact he had because uh, yeah. because um, he he didn't even get to see Blade Runner. So and never he didn't really get to get to see the whole impact he had. He had, and he never also his his daughters are making the money, which is good for them. But uh, yeah, well, speaking as the person who just finished writing the unfinished PKD. Um, he also left behind lots of unfinished, really great stuff. And his outline for his last novel, he did four attempts to do the owl in the daylight, but the, the fourth of the concepts, the one he was actually going to sit down and write would have been a really groundbreaking piece of alien science fiction. And, um, uh, I'm really sad that we didn't get it, but you can read about it in my book soon, unfinished PKD, which is a horrible segue and plug. But um, any last things you guys want to say about Marsh, Martian Odyssey before I uh, promote our next episode in this series? Um, uh, one of my pet peeves, I guess you have to say, is the criticism that a lot of early science fiction gets regarding its characterization and uh, or lack thereof, the claim of lack thereof. And uh, Martian Odyssey is another example of using stock characters, the chemist, the biologist, the engineer, but in an effective characterization manner. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. Martin Cora, Odyssey any last thoughts? Is, yeah, sorry, <laughs> that was a little <laughs> bit early. Martin Odyssey is, well, it's it suffers from the curse of the groundbreaking breaking story, which has been <laughs> superseded by later attempts attempt simply because when it came out in 1934, there had been nothing like it before. Okay, maybe this Binder story I've never read and never heard of. Heard of, um, But of course, to a modern reader, reader, you have to put yourself in the mindset of the 1930s to see how groundbreaking this story was, because to a modern reader, it's basically a travelogue across Mars. And yes, uh, 
the characterization, I mean, the most memorable character is Tweel, but then I suspect he's supposed to be the most memorable character. Mm -hmm. Character, The other guys are stock characters, but I still think it's very, very progressive for the air that these are, that this is an international crew because it's it's not that unusual. Um, Lensman has also has some international yeah. characters. They're not all, yeah, this is something which really, really surprised me the first time I read it was that there was a German general or something. Because you almost never get positive German characters in early science fiction or even modern science fiction. So this is quite, uh, so yes, yes, it's a case that we often have with very, very early science fiction. It's, you also have, for example, I just said, mentioned Lanzmann, E.E. E. Smith, or lots of early science fiction that, they, that it has been superseded by later attempts. But this was the first time someone did this. Did this. This was the foundation. And that's why the story is still worth reading. Also, it's well written, it's fun, it's not very long, it's not very long and it's not a slog or anything. It's still a good story, good story even almost 90 years later, but and if you want to see where a lot of today's ideas of alien aliens come from, from this is it. Also, especially talking about Frederick Brown, you're doing Arena eventually. Arena's very alien alien mm -hmm. was probably influenced by, by very much influenced by this uh, or by the Weinbaum aliens in general. And Freddie Brown has some very alien aliens for the era. Yeah, agreed. And, um, well, okay, so I'm going to tie my little bow on Martian Odyssey is that I think it deserves its place here in the Hall of Fame. This one fits not all the stories I'm going to say that about. Um, one of the things I wanted to do in this series eventually is you know end with what story by this author deserved to be here more than this one <laughs> because a couple of these authors a couple of these stories this is one where obviously i think this one deserves to be here and it's it's uh it's you also it's, don't have much of much of a choice with weinbaum for science fiction stories so that's basically exactly. there's a dark flame and uh there's valley of dreams and this uh this one so do we but all story... agree do we all yeah. agree that this story is a great opener for the Hall of Fame? Because I think oh, it absolutely. 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 Okay. We all agree on that. Okay. Well, our next episode in this series, I'm not sure if it's going to be the next episode of the podcast, but um, uh, I have already uh, booked our panel for Twilight by John W. Campbell. We're going to have uh, the guy who literally wrote the book on John W. Campbell, Alec Neville Lee. Oh, be, wow. <laughs> yes. Will be joining us on the Twilight um, panel. And um, James Reich, the publisher of Stocking Horse Press and author of The Moth for Stars and uh, Song My Enemies Sing, which is a great if you never read James Reich's novel, The Song My Enemies Sing, it's a great tribute to out-of-date Martian science fiction that was written a few years ago. Um, it was one of my favorite novels of, I think, 2018 when it came out, 2019. But uh, James, that letter, that novel is a love letter to out-of-date Martian science fiction um, and a modern novel. So James is going to be on that panel. And mm -hmm. then uh, doctoral student and science fiction scholar Kate Hefner we'll be rounding out the panel. So it'll be Alec, James, and Kate um, for Twilight by John W. Campbell next time. And then after that, we have Helen Alloy by Lester Del Rey. And I have not put a panel together for that one yet. <laughs> I'm working on it. Probably not going to be very Helen easy. Alloy. Yeah. Well, that one, I'm trying to get a robotics expert, and I don't know if that's worthwhile. Um, because... <laughs> It's the story yeah, song. it's a pity, like I said, that's the only rob robot story in this, uh, because we should have had an Asimov robot story, but of course we have Nightfall for Asimov, which is one of these uh, all-time classics that you, you just can't ignore. But we don't really have a, uh, but it's a pity that we have no other robot story from the Golden Age uh, other than Helen Alloy. Should have, if you want a robot story, it should have had the proud robot. Yeah, the proud robot would have been good. Of course, uh, we already have Kutner. Well, Proud yeah. Robot was solo Kutna, but we oh, already no, have Kutner yeah, more familiar as a Borogrops, which is a wonderful You Paget here. You can still have Kutner, I think. Yes, of course. Uh, we will pretend <laughs> to not to know that Louis... I mean, we're also missing Lawrence O'Donnell then. 
And of course, I mean, you could put together a whole anthology just of Kutna and Moore and their various, their various pen yeah. names. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and I love that Maltzberg. Uh, okay. We have a robot. We have a robot in the Hudling place. I forgot the name now of the robot. robot oh, yeah. Right, There's a robot right. butler. But <laughs> True. It's not a robot story. <laughs> All right. Uh, Steve, how can folks find you and Amazing Stories online? Uh, www.amazingstories.com and what have you got coming up with uh you got a convention coming up for the well, we have we've introduced the uh, last couple of months some new features one is called for the magazine online one is called unexpected questions which is a uh interview series where uh authors and artists and editors answer unexpected questions um and uh, we're also uh, getting, we're working on doing a, a podcast of readings of new works that are coming out. Um, right now, I've got something like uh, 12 or 14 authors lined up um, to do that. And we're, I'm, I'm still investigating technologies to, to uh, do that with. But we're all, and then the big thing that you mentioned, thank you, is uh, the SF100 convention which is going to be taking place in April of 1926 uh, online and uh, live in uh, Richmond, Virginia, or close enough, um, which is a celebration of 100 years of science fiction and Amazing Stories magazine. Which I think is awesome. And, Thank you. Uh, I'm really excited you're doing that. Cora, how do people find the Hugo Award winning writing of Cora Bullard? Well, um, you can find me online at uh, korabulot.com. It's uh, C-O-R-A-B-U-H-L-E-R-T. And um, you can also find me under the same name name on uh, Twitter or whatever the X or whatever it's called <laughs> now, on Blue Sky, on uh, Mastodon. So, yes, I'm all over the social media place. And uh, you can also, if you put uh, the name into into Amazon or any other online bookstore, you can also find my books and stories. Awesome. Or if you go, or if you go to the uh, Hugo Awards website, yes, you can also find my my name listed on the Hugo Awards website. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, uh, pretty exciting. I was very i i i was when I read that you won. <laughs> I remember sitting in my chair and going like this. <laughs> I was very proud of you, Cora. Well, I, I mean, very excited well, thanks a lot. <laughs> I, actually, I actually learned that because I wasn't on site. I learned that I won via a Zoom chat because I was in the because the votes of finalists were in Zoom to be switched online, and uh, because uh, the person who won the astounding award was Shelley Parker Chan. She was also virtual because she's in Australia, and um, she had no idea that she'd won because you can't uh, because you can't hear the live stream if you're in the Zoom. Right. Otherwise, uh, you would get the <clears> feedback. <throat> and so I told the guy who did the the Zoom moderator later. I t I told him um, could, you should maybe let us know who won. Otherwise, because uh, otherwise uh, we won't know. So and I was the first person to actually profit from that <laughs> from that. And so I learned that I'd won a Hugo via via Zoom and uh, didn't see any audience or reaction or anything. I was I, all I saw was basically my own face. And I was doing my speech and doing my little <laughs> playing with my and bringing out my my He-Man figures, which I to which I probably wouldn't have done if I actually expected to win to win. But since I pre-planned it, I did it that way. It was really funny because I was literally just looking at myself and sitting there at three. It was after no, it started at three a.m. It was after three a.m. It must have been in about three thirty or four or something by the point by the point. So I was sitting there in the middle of the night and. To, giving a speech into a computer, computer, which was actually, I think I would have been a lot more nervous if there had been a lot of people out there. <laughs> well, yeah. true. You, you, you got well to do deserved. it. For, yeah. And well-deserved and you got to do it from home, which is Thank correct. you. Yeah. Um, um, so. And I, will, I got I, to, got to, you got to drink champagne with, I went, I went to my parents afterwards. I'd asked, uh, I'd, I'd gotten the permission to wake them. They were both still alive at the time, at the time and still living at home now. No one isn't it? No, my father's gone and my mom is in the nursing home. So I'd gotten the permission to wake them up, and that's what I did. And then we had champagne and fancy Belgian chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys will certainly be back. I don't know if you'll be together on these panels, but I will definitely be inviting you guys again. 
Um, I I'd know. I'd be very happy to. Yeah, lots I know. of good stories here, and also some some stories which are well worth talking about. Not worth talking about, even if there are so some stories where you think, okay, what were they thinking? Some stories like, okay, this is a controversial story, but it still deserves to be here. Yeah. Well, yeah, you guys will be back. I know, um, Steve, you're, I think I've got you for Ted Sturgeon on my short list. I believe you. Microcosmic God. Yes. And I know, uh, Cora, I, I, I really want to have you on the, the pageant, the Mimsy episode. I would so. love to do that one because it's a wonderful story and I love it. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people have asked to be on that one. If I put yeah. everyone <laughs> who asked to be on that one, we'd have 17 people. Um, if you, but, uh, Corey, if you do discuss that, I would greatly appreciate it if at some point you mentioned the fact that there is no scene in the story where somebody cries on a rabbit plushie. Well, you put it familiar with the now. movie Mimsy? Yes, I know. Um, the movie with uh, well, yeah, all right. Well, not... you, put it out, you put it out here, Steve. It's here, so all right. Um, science fiction hall of fame <laughs> episode. One is now in the books. Thanks for listening. And um, folks, please come back for this series. Look up our panelists and follow their work. Um, I appreciate if you're nerd enough to have made it to this point, you rule. And um, we will see you again with Twilight by John W. Campbell. Thank you.